I'm kind of confused because I was always taught that the Catholic Church was a bad thing, you know? Well, not yeah. the not the people, but that it's part of the end times. And who told you that? Place and, who taught you that? Huh? Who taught you that? Well, well my father's a Seventh Day Adventist. Oh wow! Wait, wait, wait. You mean the Seventh Day Adventists who believe in Ellen G. White, a false prophetess who supposedly received revelations? Right. And right, that's right, where right. you take it from. A, it's like a Muslim telling me the Bible's corrupt and Christianity's corrupt because in the Trinity. Do you really care what Muslims got to say about the Bible and Christianity as a whole? Absolutely not. But so why I've should I care about also, Ellen G. White? From, uh, well, why should I care about Ellen G. White? What does she have to say? No, I don't care about her. But like that's myself. where your father just... got it from. Diego, you got to listen more than you speak. That's where okay. your father got it from. He got it from Ellen G. White who's a false prophetess who could attack the Roman Catholic Church. And Ellen G. White is simply the fruit of a bad tree that sprung up in the 19th century with all these end-time prophecy experts, right, where you have the Camelites and the Millerites, and then you have Charles Taze Russell. Why should any of their opinions matter? They come in the 19th century. They're all false prophets who assigned end-time dates to Jesus that were never fulfilled. Why should they have any right to tell me what the catholic church is no i'm not arguing with you i agree with you that's i'm just trying to yeah. break out of what i've been taught no that's I'm my answer to... to your question i'm not saying you're arguing with me. that's my question why should i care what charles taze russell the forerunner of the joe's witnesses has to say about the catholic church why should i care what the millerites that which is actually that spearheaded the adventist movement have to say about the catholic church why should i care about ellen g white or the these were all movements that started in the 19th century, 1800s, or Joseph Smith. He also came out of that pool, that cesspool. Why should I care what any of those heretics, false prophets, end time so-called Bible prophecy experts that signed wrong dates to Jesus and had to keep tweaking and changing the dates when it didn't come to pass? Why should I care what any of those tools of the devil have to say when they arose in the 19th century and they've proven, to them, proven themselves to be false prophets. You see my point? Right. I do understand. I, I understand what you're saying. It's just, I do believe that there's saved people within the Catholic Church. I don't, I mean, I believe that there's true, sincere people who believe in Jesus and they want but to But let me ask Jesus. you a question. How much, how much knowledge do you have in church history and the Bible to tell me what you believe about the Catholic Church? How much studying have you done? I've done a lot of studying, but I'm not really too... Uh, studying I'm in the too, early the church? church uh, yeah, see, I, I'm not too good on the church. So you haven't done a lot that. of studying. You've done a lot of studying in what? Well, I've just done studying in... In what? Like Baptist... Uh, like the Baptist church and their views on it and all and that the stuff. The Baptist you know, church started when? I guess the Baptist church started in the early 1800s, right? Okay, or so early well, whatever. Anabaptists, they say the Anabaptists were around even at the time right. of the Reformers. But even the Reformers killed Anabaptists. Right, right. So yeah. now, okay, now yes. you got, well, yeah. brother, if you breathe a little bit and listen, maybe you'll get further with me. Because you're talking over me and you're not going to be listening. That's why James 1.19, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger. Listen so you understand how you're putting yourself in a hole that you can't need to come out of. Okay, so even if we go with the Baptists, there were reformers that condemned the Baptists as heretics. So why do you agree with the Baptists over against the reformers like Martin Luther? I don't want to agree with them. I just, I'm just trying to figure it out. I want to understand. Okay. So my point is, you just said I did a lot of studying, but you did a lot of studying in Baptist theology. That's not a lot of studying. Right. So don't you think you owe it to yourself to detach from any tradition? detach Absolutely. from any tradition and now ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. Say, Holy Spirit, cleanse me and purify me of all my filthy, wicked sins and also all of my wrong doctrines. And now guide me and let me now honestly look at how you have been working throughout the church for the past 2000 years so that the church doesn't start in the 19th century or in the 16th century. Let me see what I can find historically and study all of these great men of the faith and women of the faith that you use to preserve the church and see what they believed and what they looked like and see whether it is true that Catholics today are heretics or do I find a lot of continuity between what the early church fathers believed in Catholicism, which also extends to Orthodox and Coptic. That's what, In other words, your journey may end up making you an Orthodox. Doesn't mean you necessarily okay. become Catholic. What I'm just trying to say is, 
if you end up becoming Orthodox, you're going to be more sensitive to the Catholics because the Catholics and the Orthodox have a lot in common. They have more in common than disagreements. Okay. So why don't you start fresh? You've been raised among Protestants, and so you have a Protestant bias. And everyone has a bias. Listen to me, everyone. Catholics who raise Catholics have a Catholic bias. They're biased too. Orthodox who've been raised Orthodox, they have an Orthodox bias. They're biased too. Coptics and anyone who's been raised in a particular tr Christian tradition, they are automatically biased for their tradition and against anything else that disagrees with their tradition. So when a Catholic who's a cradle Catholic tells me the Catholic Church is right, that doesn't impress me because an Orthodox who's a cradle Orthodox will tell me the Orthodox is right. You know when I get impressed? When someone who's a Protestant becomes Catholic or someone who's Protestant becomes Orthodox. or, an or That's when I start wanting to listen. Hey, hold on. You were biased against the Catholic tradition as a Protestant. After all these years of studying, you became Catholic. What made you change your mind? Or, hey, hold on. You were biased against the Orthodox Church. And all these years of studying, you became Orthodox. Now I want to listen to why you, who are against this tradition, now embraced it. For example, now one of the most famous converts to the Orthodox Church, you know what it is? Who? Hank Hedegraaff, the Bible answer man. <laughs> Like, let me write that down real quick so I can look them up because I really want to look into this more because I'm uh, I'm kind of green when it comes to the early church fathers and early church history. But I really want to learn and I want to figure it out. Do Hank Hanegraaff, his last name is hard to spell. Do Bible answer man Hank Hanegraaff. He just entered into the Orthodox Church. And you know why that's significant? Can I tell you why? Go ahead. Hank Hanegraaff for years was known as the Bible answer man. The Bible answer man is a radio program that was started by Walter Martin, one of the leading Protestant evangelical scholars. And this man was an evangelical scholar. Well, he's not a scholar, but an evangelical apologist who believed in Sola Scriptura. And after all these years of studying, became Orthodox. Okay. Now, that's interesting because this man, if you go in, uh, to his archives and you watch his lessons, he brought in his sessions. He brought in the best Protestant evangelical debaters, theologians, and apologists. And he still became, he still became Orthodox. Awesome. Can you give me that name one more time? Hank Hennegraaff, the Bible Answer Man. Now, that's someone who converted to orthodoxy. Now you have celebrated Protestants, celebrated Protestants who became Catholic. What I want you to look up, look up something called the journey home, right? Okay. His name is, uh, last name is, is Marcus Grodi. M A R C U S G R O D I Marcus Grodi Journey Home every Monday live he interviews a Protestant who became Catholic whether Baptist Calvinist Lutheran Seventh Day Adventist he's got a hundred such testimonies go watch and listen to why they became Catholic okay. Now, what's my point? After your journey, you may still remain Protestant. That's okay with me. What I'm trying to say is you and I owe it to ourselves to stop reading what others tell you about the Catholic Church that are not Catholic. Read what the Catholics say about their faith and then see whether you agree or disagree. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Anytime, man. Did that make sense, Diego? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I really appreciate it. I'll be listening, and I just love it when you muzzle the Muslims. Man, I love it too, bro. All right, man. God bless. Have a okay. good night. God bless you, man. Be the Lord be with you. Now we got this guy, Daniel, who's acting tough, saying, I called him. I called him. Yeah, let me hang up Ooh. on him because of you. Okay, now let's see how good you are, tough guy. You better not be barking. You better be answering questions. <laughs> Oh, Daniel, so you ready now? I'm ready. Let's go. Go to John 8, 17, 18. John 8, 17, 18. Okay. Yeah, let's see if you really, really believe your modalism. God's omnipresence is not going to work for you. It's going to work against you. But go to John 8, 17, 18. Okay, I, I'm there. Read it for me, please. It says, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So the Father and Son are how many witnesses? How many men? Uh, two. Two what? 
Uh, two witnesses. Uh, no, actually, read it. Two men, right? Yeah, two men for the uh, Jewish testimonies. Okay, can I ask you a question? I believe the Father is one who bears witness, his spirit, and Jesus is the man Christ Don't Jesus. Don't tell me what you believe. Answer the question. Do you believe Jesus is a different person from the Father? Uh, no, I believe they're the same. Okay, but wait, wait. Reread it again. This is why I said don't tell me what you believe. Answer the question and try to prove it because I just gave you a verse you're not paying attention to. See, this is the problem I have with you heretics. You don't pay attention. You think you're paying attention. You think you have a response. Let's see if you're paying attention. Count how many men again. It says the testimony of two men is true. How many men are the father and the son? It says there are two men. Not according to you. You just said there are not two men, two persons. Because the word men means person. Because I don't believe God, uh, God is two men. Um, well, I don't, I don't care what that. you believe. Listen, don't tell me what you believe. The text is in front of you. See, this is where we're having a... Don't tell me your belief. Deal with the text. You just told me Jesus and the Father are not two men, two persons. Jesus said you're a liar. We are two men, two persons. Answer that for but me. Are they two divine persons or is it one human person? Oh, so, one okay, person? even better. So you're now saying Jesus is a human person? I believe he is a human being. Okay, so no, no, no. I See, you, you changed my words again. Daniel, if you're not going to pay attention, I'm going to hang up on you. Let me repeat it again. Okay, sorry. Is Jesus a human person? Yes. And the Father is a divine person, right? That's correct. Okay, I want you to repeat it because when I ask you questions, you're not going to tap dance. As long as you answer honestly, I will treat you with respect if you answer honestly. So you just said the Father is one divine person and Jesus is a human person, right? That's correct. A human person is created and a human person cannot do what God does. Simple as that. You agree with me, right? That's correct. Okay, go to John 10, 27 to 28. Let's see here. Um, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Uh, do you want to read okay, the next now verse? hold on. Now, Jesus is the Son. This is the human person speaking, according to you. That's what you said. This is the human person speaking. The human person just said, I give them everlasting life. No one can pluck that out of my hand. That's the human Jesus, the human person. Now notice the divine person in verse 29. It says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And then in verse 30 says, I am my father. one," Which will come there in a minute before we do that. I want to repeat what you said because we got you recorded. You said Jesus is the human person and the Father is the divine person. And no human person can do what only God can do. So can you explain to me how does the human person, the human person, Jesus, give everlasting life to all believers when that's something only God can do? Because that means you have to be almighty to do it. Because the Father gave that man all authority over all flesh. That's not the answer to the question. Having authority is not the same thing as being omnipotent. Let me repeat my question again because you're not getting it. Jesus, the human person, the man said, I will give them everlasting life. They will never perish. No one plucks them out of my hand. For him to do that, he has to be all powerful. Being given authority to rule is one thing. Being all powerful is another thing. How can Jesus, the man, the human person, give never-ending, incorruptible life to multitudes of people when that's something only God can do, and that's not the divine person speaking, that's the human person speaking according to you? I believe it's because it's the Father doing the works through him. That's not what he said. He, does, he says, I'm doing it with the Father. I and the Father are one. So they're doing it together. The human person and the divine person are doing it together. How does a human person do what only the divine person can do? Uh, because I have to believe that they're one. And one, know, they're wait, one, one what? The one in the sense that he shared the divine nature, right? Okay, Man, so wait, wait. So Jesus, the, the human person, is divine? I believe he's divine because the Father is in him. That makes okay, him but divine. the Father is in you. Are you divine? Uh, no, but I wasn't born like a virgin birth. I wasn't born Irrelevant. with a deity in me. That has nothing to do with the virgin birth. has nothing to do with the father being in him. Show me where it says being born of the virgin makes 
him divine because that makes the father in him. Show me that in the Bible, what you just said. No, it's not in there. Okay, let's try it again. You just said the father's in him that makes him divine. The father's in you. Does that make you divine? Uh, no, uh, no, but I do have uh, part of the day. He does give us a divine nature in some sense, doesn't he? Okay, so in what sense are you divine? That means you're all-powerful, omnipresent, all-knowing? Or does it mean, like God, you become morally incorruptible and you become deathless? Um, I believe I've become morally incorruptible. And deathless, uh, right? And, I live with, and deathless, right? Live for okay, the Lord, but wait, the Daniel, Lord forever. Daniel, my friend, because you sound like a good person and an and because of that, I want to treat you with respect. I thought you're one of these heretics that just wants to come and attack, but you're not like that, and I respect that. Daniel, my friend, right. Jesus, the human person, doesn't simply share the divine nature in the sense that he's morally incorruptible and deathless. He does what only God Almighty can do, which he does not allow a creature to do. Give never-ending, everlasting, immortal life. That's something you'll right. never do, I'll never do, but it's done to us. But Jesus, the human person, does it. How? If he's not truly fully God, and not simply because the Father's in him. He has to be divine, right? Okay, well, I know he's divine, but you're telling me it's because the Father's in him. But the Father's in you. You're not divine in the sense that you can't give never-ending, immortal, everlasting life. All right. I'll tell you, just to be honest, the reason why I... You know, I, I've been back and forth. I'm just going to be honest. Good, you know, a couple right, times fine. going to Trinity. But it's because when he talks to Philip, he makes it sound like when you see me, you see the Father. What, what do you mean show us the Father? Exactly. Don't you know me already? Like, yeah, but the, he explained it to you. He says, not the Father. Because he explained it to you. He goes, because the Father's in me right now, in me right now, working with me, doing the works. That's why. Because the Father's in me right now, not because I am the Father. He could have simply said, he who sees me sees the Father because I am the Father. Did he say I am the Father? Or he says, because the Father's in me, that's how you see the Father, because he's with me right now, working through me. Mm -hmm. He says I'm in the Father as well. That's my point. Why does he say the Father's in me, I in him, if he is the Father? It's like me saying, I'm in me, and me is in me. What does that mean? I right. am in me and me. That doesn't make sense. That only makes sense if the Father is not the Son, but He's present with the Son, working in the Son, and revealing Himself through the Son, not because He is the Son, because He's there with the Son. Right. Just like Jesus is with you, and He's working in you, and working through you. But that doesn't mean you are Jesus. Right, so you believe that Jesus is a pre-eternal Son or the pre-eternal Word? Well, you, you, you make a distinction. Yeah. yeah, well, that depends on which Trinitarians. Historically, historically, if you go back as far as you can go from the last apostle when he went into glory, and you read the church, their disciples of the apostles and their disciples and disciples, everyone agreed Jesus is the eternal, pre-existent Word and Son of God. It's not. It's not until modern protestantism that you have a denial that jesus is the eternal son though he's the eternal word but if you go historically what the church has believed historically as far back as you can go from the writings of the disciples of the apostles and their disciples after them and i'll give you some names ignatius irenaeus tertullian just these are the ones that were the disciples of the apostles or the disciples of the disciples of the apostles no one denied that jesus was the word before creation and the son before creation they believed he's the word and the son before creation came into being okay so why would he be called the word in your estimate john 18 explains it to you because he reveals the father to us john 18 explains it read it for me open up your bible okay john 1 18 uh says uh, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Okay, wait. So what does the Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, do? He declares the Father. Okay, so that's what it means. What do you do with your word? When you speak with your word, what do you do with your word? You declare yourself. You make yourself known, right? All right. So Jesus is the word in that he's the one who declares the Father to us, makes the Father known to us, and 
because of his revelation, we're able to know God truly and have a relationship with him. That's what it means. Right, right there, John 1, 18. And now go to John 17, verse 6 for the further confirmation of what it means for him to be the word. John 17, verse 6. Okay, let's see here. It says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. I've done what with your name? Uh, it says, I have manifested your name. By the way, let me correct Private Eye for pretending to hear me. Private Eye, I'm going to block you for misrepresenting me. It's recorded. Shame on you for bearing false witness. I didn't say Protestants don't believe Jesus is the eternal son of God. Clean out your ears and don't let Satan cause you to bear false witness. I said it wasn't until Protestantism that the sonship of Christ among Protestants, not all Protestants, was denied as being eternal sonship. And that is a fact. Walter Martin is a Protestant who denied Jesus as eternal son. William Lane Craig is a Protestant who denies that Jesus is eternal son. So don't pretend that you heard me correctly because you just misrepresented me and bore false witness and slandered me. I didn't say all Protestants, but it is a fact. It isn't until Protestantism that that doctrine of the eternal sonship is denied because historically, if you go from the second century onwards, all Christians that were Orthodox in their belief affirmed Jesus was already the son before all creation. Stop misrepresenting me. Now, coming back, Read John 17, verse 26. Okay. Let's see here. Um, John 17, verse says, 26. Yeah, it says, And I have declared to them your name and will declare it. Now, hold on. Before you go on, my, it's not my delivery It's clear. It's because you're a stupid, satanic bastard that wants to hear what you want to hear to slander me. So, no, it's you because your father, the devil, has clogged up your ears, you tool of the devil. The Lord Jesus rebuke you. Now read John 17, 26. Go ahead, brother. It says, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Okay, now let me ask you the question. What does it mean that Jesus declares, makes known the name of the Father to his followers? That means he declares and makes known the character, the nature of the Father, right? Right, like he makes salvation known, right? Not only salvation, he makes God known to us truly. He tells you what okay. God is, what God is not, who the Father is. And he's the one who, because he makes the Father known to us truly, he perfectly reveals the character of the Father. We can now know the Father truly and love the Father for who he is and not for what we make him out to be. You understand? Right. So, And, and that's why he's called the Word, because you need to use your Word to make yourself known. You need to use your word to manifest yourself to me. In other words, if you're a stranger and I see you in the street, if you don't tell me who you are, all you're going to be is a stranger, right? Right. Exactly. But the moment you open your mouth and you speak with your words, you say, hi, hi, my name is Daniel. Okay, now I learned something about you. You're Daniel. I was born in a cer certain place. And this is my age and this is my, now I got to know you because now you're using your words to make yourself known to me. So in the Gospel of John, Jesus is called the Word because he's the one that the Father sends with the Spirit to make God known to the world, to declare God and his nature to the world so that the world can know who the true God is and have a correct understanding of that true God. All right. Is that clear now? Yeah, that's clear. I want to know, uh, last thing is... Uh... Uh, two quick, quick questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you believe that water baptism uh, is for the remission of sin? Because I heard the Orthodox Church teaches yes. that, and of course the Christians today don't. Just, no, no. So when you say Christian, no. The historic position of the church, the historic position of the church has been that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, grants forgiveness of sin and the Holy Spirit to make you spiritually alive and unite you to Jesus at water baptism. That's been the belief of the church from aeons ago, and it's supported in Scripture. And it was, it was even believed by the Reformers like Martin Luther. 
It was John Calvin that took water baptism as a sign symbolizing a reality, whereas the church historically believed it was the sign and the reality that the sign signified. In other words, it was that water baptism that the Holy Spirit would be given to you because of Jesus' grace, and the Holy Spirit would make you alive, unite you to Christ, and you'd be forgiven because of Jesus' grace. And you still have many Protestants that believe it to this day. Oh, wow. So I, I, you're basically a, a, like a Orthodox, right? Yeah, I am what they call a protesting uh, Orthodox Catholic from the East who happens to be a Syrian. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. no, 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 I confuse the heck out of you. No. Yeah, listen, the Orthodox Church... The Catholic Church, the Coptic Church, the Assyrian Church of the East, and Protestant Trinitarian Evangelical Churches, they're all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, born of the Spirit, united to the same body, worshiping the same triune God. All right. That's what it is. They just have some disagreements or whatever. Yes. Everyone has disagreements. You even have disagreements within yourself, right? All right. Yeah. Like right now, here, let me prove it to you. Right now, you, you came off trying to prove that modalism is true, but then you ended up disagreeing that modalism is true, showing that you have a war within yourself. So you even disagree with yourself. So why are you surprised mm -hmm. that you would disagree with others? Right. Right? Only thing, you know what's going to get scary for you? When in a disagreement with yourself, you refute yourself because which part of you is actually winning? Right. Because um, I keep going back and forth, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm just kidding. But yeah, keep listen. Historically, biblically, I have had several debates with modalists. Do you want me to give you the links? Historically, biblically, the church has always believed the Trinity, historically and biblically. There was at one time in the latter part of the second century, a form of modalism arose, which the Christians were, were refuting and silencing back then. So modalism has never been the dominant teaching of the church. It was a heresy that was refuted checked early on starting in the latter part of the second century because the bible clearly teaches that the father is not the son the son is not the spirit the spirit is not the father yet the father is truly divine the son is truly divine the holy spirit is truly divine and the son also became man but they're not three gods but they're not one person so then how do you then make sense out of it the only way you can make sense out of it is to come to the doctrine of the Trinity. The one eternal, infinite, almighty God eternally exists as the Father in union with the Son and in union with the Spirit. They're not the same person. They're three persons, three eternal relationships that always exist with the same essence and nature. Right. Any other thing has to distort some part of Scripture. Any other doctrine is going to deny one part of scripture distort some part of scripture because you cannot hold to the Bible as a whole consistently apart from the doctrine of the Trinity. All right. Now, do you want me to give so you the links to my debates? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. All right. I know you want to a debate with someone recently, the guy that died a little while yes, ago. Yes. Did you watch that debate or no? Yeah, I watched it. It was pretty good. Okay. So you watch both debates, right? Yeah. Okay, it was Trinity Old Testament, Trinity New Testament. Now, be honest with yourself. What did you think of the arguments, his and mine? I thought you crushed him. Say it again? I said, I thought you crushed him. So then why do you believe in I this just, this lie then? It's because I go back and forth. I get into these discussions and I let people convince me. Yeah, but remember, it's dangerous. You don't want to be one of those who's always learning but never coming to the knowledge of truth. That's 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 9. That's dangerous. And then Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. Write these down and read them. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, it says, Jesus has given you apostles, and he's given you prophets, and he's given you teachers and pastors, evangelists and pastors and teachers, to teach you spiritual truth so you can attain spiritual maturity so that you're not tossed by every wave and wind of doctrine. All right. Okay. So right now you're being tossed back and forth, to and fro, by every wave and wind of doctrine. That's not healthy. S stay settled. And the fact is, I'm letting you know, the Trinity is biblical. It is anchored in Scripture, and it's the ancient faith of the church. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise.
Now go to my blog, type in Trinity. I got dozens of articles. Go to my YouTube channel, type in Trinity. I got dozens of sessions. And also Anthony Rogers. Anthony Rogers. And you will see the evidence from the Old Testament, New Testament, Jewish sources, and the early church fathers. And they all point to God being more than one divine person. Modalism is a satanic perversion of scripture. Now, let me give you that. Right, so I'm, a, I'm a truck driver. So when I'm home, did you recommend me just going to Eastern Orthodox Church? Because the Assemblies of God, they never really teach on the Trinity. If Listen, if teach. you find an Eastern Orthodox Church, start attending it. Go to the priest or the bishop. Tell him, look, I am confused about the Trinity. And I want to accept the true God. And I want to belong to a church that is ancient and historic and anchored in scripture. Can you help me on my journey? Okay, that'd be great. Okay, brother. And then what do you think? What's the last thing that you think about Christmas? You think it's pagan? No. I've, uh... Let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. The world, when they hear of Christmas, are they thinking of paganism? Or are they thinking of Jesus Christ? What does the world yeah. think of Christmas? Who do they associate with Christmas? Jesus. In other words, why are you making it a big deal and trying to get people to see the pagan roots of Christmas, which actually it's not pagan at all. The evidence shows the pagans took December 25th from the church. The church didn't get it from paganism, but that's another topic. Why do you want to make a big deal about Christmas supposedly having pagan origins when even the world at large, the unbelieving world, associates Christmas with the birth of Jesus? Why not run with it and use Christmas as a means of preaching the gospel to unbelievers because they already think Christmas is the birth of Jesus, not some pagan god? Right. So why don't you use that? Hey, world. When you think Christmas, who do you think of? Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you who Jesus is. His birth that we're celebrating is the birth of God Almighty in the flesh who loved you so much to come into the world to save you from God's wrath. Why then make it about paganism when the world identifies it with Jesus? All right, exactly. That's a good point. And do you believe that we can lose eternal life? Like if we go into apostasy, would we lose it? Well, the there is ample scripture and the predominant view of the church has been that someone who refuses to walk in union with the Holy Spirit and chooses to walk away from the Holy Spirit can be cut off from the salvation that the Spirit has given that individual. This has been the majority position and there's plenty of scripture to back it up. Oh, yeah, you seem rock solid. At first, I thought maybe you were a Calvinist, but... Uh, I used to be. An Orthodox guy. My friend, I used to be. You know what oh, happened? used to be? Yes, I used to be a five-point Calvinist. And it's not... There are Calvinists who love Jesus Christ, who are on fire for the Lord, who are geniuses like Anthony Rogers. The reason why I changed is because, like you, I embraced a view that I thought was scriptural, and hopefully, like me, you'll be praying to the Holy Spirit to guide you in all truth. Because when I told the Holy Spirit, please show me what is true, show me what is false, and open my mind and heart to the fullness of the truth, no matter where it is, and I'll accept it. And the Holy Spirit start working in my life, messing my life up, making me miserable and uncomfortable with facts that I was discovering until I fully submitted. Oh, wow. So Praise I've been Lord. where you're at. I've been where you're at, where I held to a view, thought it was right. But when I asked the Holy Spirit to show me and he started showing me, it started messing me up. And I started going back and forth like you, you know, one day believing one thing, next day doubting it until finally mm -hmm. I said, you know what? The facts are clearly before my eyes. Why am I fighting? I submit and I yield. Right. Do the same, at least when it comes to the Trinity. Because knowing the right God and the true God is a matter of salvation. Because Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe I am, you shall die in your sins. In other words, you better have the right Jesus and know who Jesus is. Because the wrong Jesus that Satan has produced and erected to mislead you from the true Jesus will not save you, but damn you. And that's 2 Corinthians 11. Read for me 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 4. Read it for me. 2 Corinthians 11. Verses 2 to 4. 
Okay, so verse three and four. Two to four. Oh, two to four. It says, uh, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he who comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You see what Paul is warning you? The serpent is going to seduce you from your spiritual purity by sending someone to preach to another Jesus and present to you a different spirit and present a different gospel. In other words, right. the Jesus of modalism is another Jesus from the Jesus of Trinitarianism. All right, just like Mormonism and uh, thank you, and Jehovah Witnesses. Thank I you. Think Jesus is Michael the Archangel. <laughs> so my point, Daniel, my brother in humanity, yeah. and hopefully my brother in Jesus Christ, it is not a joke to profess the wrong Jesus. You have to have the right Jesus because the wrong Jesus can't save you. Save you. That is a satanic counterfeit to damn your soul to hell. All right, yeah, I don't want to. Go to hell at any cost, you know what I mean? So if you have an Eastern Orthodox church in your area, do you have one? Uh, yeah, I think there's one in the Tampa area. I live over by Tampa, Florida. Okay. Uh, have you been there before, Sam? No, I've been in Florida, but I don't think I've been there. But do yourself a favor. As soon as you have time, contact them and say, look, I was in this modalist church that denied the Trinity. Now I just want the truth, and I'm open to hearing what the truth is. And I've been told the Eastern Orthodox church is an ancient church started by the apostles. And I want to hear why you believe in the Trinity, what's the biblical and historical basis, and what did your church believe, and you're you're on your way home. Worship and love the Trinity, friend. The Trinity is the only true God. Do not turn to any other God, even if they claim that God is the God of the Bible. The modalist God cannot save you. It's a satanic counterfeit. It's not the real Jesus. Save yourself by being open to the truth of who God is. And when I say save yourself, meaning here, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, look, modalism is not true. It's not biblical. The true God is triune. Here, accept the true God and be saved because the true God is in love with you. So are you going to accept it? That's between you and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes, sir. Because also scripture says Antichrist is denying the Father and the Son. Yep. And you are denying the Father and the Son because you're perverting the relationship between the Father and the Son. You have a false father and a different son, and neither one can save you. Right. Does that make sense? I appreciate it. I Daniel, appreciate because you speaking the truth. No, my you friend, I mean? appreciate you. You know why? Because you first came off as someone attacking the Trinity. I thought you were going to blaspheme. But now that you came on and you have a sincere heart, call me anytime with any question, and I'll spend as much time answering your objections, I promise you.